Welcome to Everything STEAM. I'm your host, Sam Stanford. As a physicist and structural engineer with Jacobs Engineering, I've made many connections with some bright individuals who are either working, studying, or self-taught and passionate about our particular topics of discussion. Today's topic is focused on a rather promising part of the energy sector, and that's nuclear energy. Luckily, I found an outstanding guest from the depths of the science community that was willing to come on and discuss some common misconceptions about nuclear energy, its potential and trends with respect to climate change and the increasing demands of energy across the world, and then we'll cover some of the history throughout the seven decades that nuclear energy has been publicly used. So, speaking of my guest, let me introduce Kaylee Cunningham. Kaylee is a first-year PhD student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology studying nuclear science and engineering. And in May of 2022, she received her bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering from the University of Florida. Kaylee has also had some amazing research and internship opportunities that I think are really important to share. So in the summer of 2019, she interned with the Oak Ridge National Laboratories and won several awards for her research on the Versatile Test Reactor Project. And in spring of 2020, she had the opportunity to work with the University of Florida and NASA to computationally model nuclear thermal propulsion fuel. The following year, she interned with the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the Probabilistic Risk Assessment Branch and got to sit in on New Scale's Risk Assessment NRC meetings. Now this past summer, Kaylee interned with BWX Technologies in the Advanced Technologies Branch. There, she got to work on calculating corrosion rates for nuclear thermal propulsion fuel. And currently, she's working with Dr. Mike Short in the Mesoscale Nuclear Materials Group studying radiation damage in materials for fusion technology. And in terms of science communication, Kaylee is known as Miss Nuclear Energy and has acquired over 60,000 followers on TikTok for her videos advocating for nuclear energy. So now that you've been introduced to my guest star and the topic of this podcast, we're going to head into our first segment where we'll dive into nuclear energy in terms of what it is and start addressing some common misconceptions. Cheers. Kaylee, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. Like I said, I am six days away from going to Cancun. Of course, this is going to air, what, two days, you know, before I go to Cancun, but I'm very excited. I, <laughs> I'm ready to have a little vacation. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this first segment is really focusing on nuclear misconceptions and what nuclear energy is in the conventional method, right? Because there's a lot of research out there that has a lot of new avenues to things that we'll be talking about more in segment three. So I guess to start out, just ask the general question of for, for everybody out there, because I'm sure they're not really familiar, uh, what is the conventional way that we create nuclear energy. Right. So uh, nuclear in itself sounds like this big, mystifying, scary thing. Um, but at the end of the day, it's harnessing the energy that already exists in atoms, right? So we're trying to use fundamental energy to produce electricity. So our traditional commercial nuclear power plants in the United States, at least, um, are mostly what we call light water reactors. Um, and they function off of this basic process called nuclear fission, right? So what we're doing here is separating atoms. So you essentially start with a neutron, Right. You know, if we think of our old atomic structure from chemistry, high school chemistry, you know, you've got the nucleus and the electrons buzzing around the nucleus of the atom. And then deep down inside that nucleus, it's made up of protons and neutrons. Right. And uh, the neutron, when uh, we take an individual neutron and launch it at, for example, a uranium atom, um, then that splits that atom into two, right? Fissioning, splitting apart, and that produces more neutrons. 
And those more neutrons can then bump into more atoms to split apart into what we call a chain reaction. And when these atoms are splitting apart, they're producing these neutrons and they're also releasing a ton of heat, right? Mm -hmm. A ton of energy. And that heat we use to boil water to produce steam. And that steam turns a turbine and that's how we produce our electricity. Yeah, it's kind of like, if you're really familiar with the coal process, it's the same thing as a steam furnace, just without the coal, right? It's it's using yeah. fission rather than a coal furnace. Exactly. Uh, additionally, if you want to know more about that fundamental process, which is the beta decay using the, the electroweak or mainly now the weak nuclear force, I would recommend that you would go listen to our four fundamental forces podcast because I went like in depth about the weak force. So that's pretty much what it is. And we're just speeding it up by bombardment. We're shooting neutrons and speeding up that process to create something that's, I guess, a lot more efficient. So could you take me through why we use water? So water is the, the moderator of, of the process. Why are we using water in the reactor? So it depends on the reactor type, right? In the United States, we use either pressurized water reactors or boiling water reactors. Um, but in a sense, the water essentially moderates these neutrons. And by moderating, I mean, we... Uh, kind of want to keep the neutrons moving at a specific rate, right? Um, I sometimes like to think of it as slowing down neutrons, um, but sometimes we also use them or use water in this moderator to speed up neutrons. The nuclear reactor in and of itself is basically just a balancing act of trying to keep this level of neutrons constant. Um, so whether that be trying to speed up neutrons, slow them down with these things called control rods, which will absorb certain amounts of neutrons. Um, and uh, on top of that, you know, the moderator, which works with the control rods to speed up the neutrons or slow them down, just keep them running at that kind of constant pace, if that makes sense. So I think of like bees buzzing around in a hive right? We want all the bees to be buzzing around at the same rate, at the same mm -hmm. speed. And for them to be moving at the same speed, you know, they need something to be controlling them. So all these neutrons buzzing around, the things that control their speed are things like the moderator and things like the control rods. Um, now, water also has kind of a dual function in uh, these light water reactors and keeping the reactor cool. So we obviously are producing a lot of heat. We're boiling water, trying to convert that heat to electricity. Um, now, uh, what we wanna do to keep things safe is keep the reactor cool, especially when we shut the reactor down or don't want it to be producing electricity at a certain time. So the water works in a lot of different ways. Um, the third way in a boiling water reactor is to physically boil the water to produce steam. Um, so instead of having two separate systems, we have one system that the water is acting as a moderator, as a coolant, and as your steam production all at once. So it's kind of like a three-in-one special. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And the first thing that like pops into my mind when I think about conservation, and this might be one of those misconceptions that we can start out with is water usage, right? Because you think about it, you're trying to turn a turbine, keep things cool, moderate the reactor. But I'm thinking that like we've tried to address this as engineers because we try to be as efficient as possible. We're not just like, yeah, let's just use all the resources that we want. I mean, History has told us otherwise, but like over time we get better with efficiency, right? It's a learning curve. The mm -hmm. learning curve is is a is a very engineering term <laughs> that's used. <laughs> so uh, I guess how would you address the misconception of using too much water? Because it seems like you would use a boatload of water to mm -hmm. run these facilities. Is there like a um, a recycling process of the water? that like 
keeps the water usage efficiency high. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not like we're absorbing. I mean, obviously we're producing steam, so we're losing some amount of water, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not like we're constantly sucking up all the water, right? Yeah. Um, Certain designs for nuclear reactors include condensers where we actually take that steam after it's turned the turbine and condense it back down to liquid water and just keep reusing that same water. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I just wanted to address that as the first misconception <laughs> because it I've seen that recurring in a lot of forums that people are like really concerned about water usage. And I get well, that. I I think that's more recently been a thing because France is experiencing some pretty intense droughts and mm -hmm. um, not having water. I'm by no means an expert on France's nuclear industry, but um, they're definitely experiencing some issues with having enough water to keep their reactors cool. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where these sort of condenser systems should be implemented. But Again, I, I'm not an expert. I don't know a ton about that. Um, but we do have the technology to reduce the amount of water that we need to constantly be adding, if that makes any sense. No, I, I totally agree. And I also think it has to deal with the efficiency play and also location, right? Because yeah. if you're located on, say, an ocean, an ocean edge, you know, mm -hmm. there's an abundant amount of water that you can use. Obviously, you want to use it in an efficient manner, but you mm -hmm. have a lot. Say, like with a river that's mm -hmm. dealt with runoff the seasonal runoff maybe mm -hmm. it's some, like what we have in the case of france i'm not sure what their geography looks like in terms of their locations but i would say that it's definitely based on how much input how much water source you have versus your efficiency for sure right, right. um and i think there's definitely opportunities for innovation there um and implementation of these newer systems mm -hmm. france obviously has done a great job with their nuclear industry um but a lot of their reactors are coming up on their end of lifetime for their licenses so once we kind of reach the end of that reactor lifetime we get to this point where we can either retrofit the reactor to keep it open running safe and reevaluate it or we shut down the reactor and uh so the point that i'm trying to make is we a lot of these reactors are old. They're very yeah. old. So the technology is very old and a lot of times from the 60s or the 70s. And so uh, some, some just don't have this new technology implemented just yet. And that's where we start to see problems like that. That's so true. And maybe there's something else that we can put the rest here while we're kind of on the topic of water. I'm really hitting water today. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, that's <laughs> Stay hydrated, guys. <laughs> water is water is life. So, um, one thing that I saw in news reports, and this, uh, of course, this is the media, and I feel like you and I can address this here. Is there was reports from from European nations like France that were having issues with the droughts, but also issue with water being too warm in their water bodies. Mm -hmm. That bothers me as an engineer. Again, it, it because there's a such thing called heat exchangers. And it just kills me to understand that we're pushing out this extremely, I understand what really hot water does. It, it mm -hmm. affects the temperature. It affects right. biology. It, the ecosystems, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just don't know how it's not being heat exchanged from its expulsion to, to a river. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't get that. Maybe you can expand on it. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm just as astounded as you are <laughs> um, i mean we have the technology to remove that heat before we expel that water so i i i really don't have an answer for that one there's a reason why we put heat exchangers along pipes mm -hmm. and pumps because heat is lost very quickly yeah i i, I don't yeah, it just doesn't make any sense to me and i feel like that's more of a fear-mongering tactic right. so if you see anything like that in the news please disregard that yeah, and that's that's kind of the the thing uh, from our perspective. It just sounds like crazy talk, you know. Um, and uh, so I uh, I would love to see like a journal article or some sort of peer reviewed, um, scientifically backed 
something to say that this is actually happening. Um, until then, I do not trust the media with that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely a push narrative. I feel that. Yeah. So moving on from water, let's talk a little <laughs> bit about nuclear waste. I yeah. want to hear some of the common misconceptions that you get over social media. I'm, I'm very, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for this. <laughs> Okay, to everybody that is listening, nuclear waste is not, I repeat, not green glowing goo. It's just not. On Halloween, when you see these yellow 55-gallon um, drums, these like big yellow containers with the radiation symbol on there, the trefoil symbol, and you see green sludge oozing out of it, it's not green. It's not sludge. The waste <laughs> that we produce from nuclear energy directly is in the form of fuel rods. Yeah. Right? So we've got in a nuclear reactor, we've got a bunch of long, tall, skinny, almost like pins that we call fuel rods. And inside these pins, we have these little pellets. Um, and uh, these pellets are about the size of a gummy bear. And mm -hmm. we stack those gummy bear sized pellets on top of each other inside this long skinny tube. And uh, those pellets are your uranium, right? So those pellets are the radioactive material that are producing neutrons to undergo fission and producing the heat and electricity. So when uh, we're talking about the quote unquote waste problem in the United States, we're not talking about what to do with all these massive barrels of green glowing goo. We're talking about what to do with these metal rods that happen to be radioactive. Right now, after they've been irradiated, they've produced enough heat and they've gone through their life cycle, it's typically about three years is the average um, light water reactor fuel cycle. Um, these fuel rods get placed into a pool and they sit in water to quote unquote cool down. But when we say cool, we don't mean temperature wise, we mean uh, um, radiation wise. So we let the water kind of moderate any and also block and shield any of the radiation that's coming off of these fuel rods. And once they cool down enough, so they meet a certain threshold of radiation. Then they go into what we call dry cask storage. So they look like farm silos, almost. Um, maybe a little bit shorter and a little bit fatter, but identical to like a giant pan that we are stacking these fuel rods in. And they sit on the nuclear power plant site, the same site where the energy is produced, and where they cool in the pool and where they sit in these dry storage casks, they go through this whole cycle on the nuclear power plant site. So essentially, biggest myth, it's not green glowing goo. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're dealing with metal rods and these metal rods have different types of radiation coming off of them. But when stored properly, you can stand physically next to these dry storage casks that we call them, these giant cans, um, and it's safe. It's comfortable. Yeah. You know, it's you're not going to die and have your eyes bulge out of your head and um, morph into a zombie. You know, um, we have so many well-trained um, health physicists, medical physicists, and uh, members of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that work to make sure that these are safe. Um, now, the question is, what do we do with it after it's been sitting on the reactor site? And that's where things get a little hairy to, you know, um, describe it, I guess. Um, things get a little crazy politically with where to put the fuel. We have the technology to store it permanently um, in what we call geological repositories, yeah. which are these almost like giant tunnels underground, deep, deep underground, far enough underground that it's not going to contaminate any groundwater. That's a 
big thing that I've heard people concerned with. Um, but we have to keep in mind, and something I like to remind people of is that the uranium that has undergone fission came from the ground, right? We're getting it to a point where it's cooled off enough that it's not super radioactive and then putting it back in the ground where we got it. Can but, I interject and, and say something by the numbers yeah. that might help? Absolutely. So if you were to stand over maybe these containment uh, areas or even an open reactor, say there's 10 feet of water that's between you and the reactor core, you would only get 0.1 milliram per day. And that is less than what you would get from a from granite. Say you say you hiked a granite mountain, you would get more radiation from that granite mountain in that day than you would standing over those containment zones or the reactor itself. So you're fine. That's the yeah. best way to put it. Uh, another reference, um, one banana is 0 0.01 millirem. So that is the equivalent of 10 bananas. There you go. So you eat 10. I don't, I don't recommend you eat 10 bananas, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you walk by in the grocery store and there's bundles of bananas. Yeah. You, you walk by more than 10 bananas. They sell more than 10 bananas a day, you yeah. know. Um, so radiation wise, it's not going to hurt you. I think right. the scariest part that people have a tough time digesting is that we can't physically see it. And that makes it hard to understand. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, we have scientifically proven that the radiation is safe to be exposed to. We have the resources to be storing this waste long term. Um, it's just a matter of educating the public that it is safe. Yeah, it's a big thing. Public perception. We have to change mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I agree. So mm -hmm. another thing that I think is really important is the transportation, because I've heard a lot that like there's a lot of issues with transporting nuclear waste. We don't really transport nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. It's all on site. Typically, am I, am I correct by saying that? And anything that has been transported, there has never been a reported issue. Anytime we've transported anything. Most of the time, we're dealing with either radioactive materials for research purposes or maybe transporting fuel to a reactor from a vendor for a new reactor that's coming online. Um, and even in that case, before it's been irradiated, before it's been in the reactor, um, when we do these shipments, I actually, one of my professors at the University of Florida was super involved. I remember him giving a talk on the experience he had watching, uh, I think they were shipping a dry cask, like full of waste, um, specifically to do some sort of research or some sort of tests to understand like safety measures with shipping these things. If we choose to ship them, to a geological repository when we get to that point. So it's a, it's actually kind of interesting, the process in that, first off, we know the casks are safe. We know they're safe because we can physically stand next to them and not experience any radiation dose higher than the typical background levels you get from existing day to day, right? Um, so the radiation isn't as much of a hazard and people get concerned about accidents, right? Like what if car accident? Mm -hmm. So what a lot of people don't know is nuclear power plants in the United States, at least after 9-11, all of the nuclear power plants were retrofitted to be able to withstand a plane crash. Part of these nuclear power plant sites are their waste storage. So included in that kind of loop is the waste storage. Essentially, what I'm saying is the dry casks could get hit by an airplane and you would not have a radiation leak. We have engineers yeah. that work specifically to make sure that these buildings will be safe if there was some sort of attack like that. So the impact of an airplane you know, we're a force mass acceleration, F equals MA. 
Um, a lot of times the impact of an airplane is a little bit more severe than a car accident. We're driving a lot faster um, and we're a lot farther from the ground. And as we speed up, accelerating. So if we can withstand a plane crash, we can withstand a car accident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've even seen videos where they take those casks and they like drive a train into it. It's, yeah. it's good. It's some there, really awesome material. <laughs> yeah, it's there's some cool people that work on that stuff and it's been very successful. Um, so from the scientific and engineering side, I don't see shipping fuel casks as an issue. I agree. So do, you, do you have any other misconceptions that you want to talk about before we talk about emissions? Because I think emissions is really good for segment two. Mm. Yeah. Go for water. It. It's just water, guys. Um, I have had so many interactions through social media where um, people come off just trashing nuclear because of all this icky, gross smog that's coming off of the nuclear power plants. You can see it. But the reality is these are cooling towers and this is steam coming off of the nuclear power plant. I, I don't know about you guys, but I think steam is a lot better to be spit out into the environment than smoke um, or, you know, any kind of byproducts from burning coal. So, yeah. but I know, uh, Sam, you're the expert here on the water vapor and the impact on the greenhouse gases. So if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, it's actually kind of funny because Kaylee had a video that was saying it's just water vapor. And then I'm like, I, I reached out to her I'm like, can I, can I stitch your video and explain? And I did. And this has actually been my most successful, successful video. Awesome. It was like about 25 K which is good for me, <laughs> good for me. <laughs> and I just wanted to reiterate that water vapor is uh, an effect of climate change. It doesn't create climate change. And it's just part of the natural water cycle. First of all, the amount of water vapor that we emit from, and I hate to say emit, but what we give off from nuclear power plants is minuscule to the overall water cycle that already exists, right? Without the water cycle, Earth would be really freaking cold, let me tell you, because water vapor goes into the atmosphere, it condenses and falls out as rain, as we know. Now, the thing is, is that with water vapor, it's part of a positive feedback loop. And this positive feedback loop is all because of the envelopment of greenhouse gases. So your carbon dioxide, your methane, your nitrous oxide, when that goes into the atmosphere, it will trap and heat up the earth right? So when you have a further heating of the earth, you then evaporate more water. So more water vapor goes into the atmosphere, which then in turn heats up the earth more. It is, if there wasn't the same, so if you slowed the amount of carbon emissions, let's just say carbon emissions alone, because that's the majority. If you slowed it down, that positive feedback loop would whimper out and you wouldn't have this insane warming effect. You would have a minuscule amount by the amount of water vapor that's emitted or expelled by nuclear energy. So it's fine. It, it's like, it's actually great. <laughs> if we had more nuclear, like we'll get into in the next segment, we would be helping out with climate change. So when we come back, we'll talk <laughs> about that more. So stick around. We're back. This is segment two. So I wanted to quickly start out because we kind of forgot or we dropped the ball on something that we really, really wanted to talk about, but for some reason just kind of like slipped away from us. So Kaylee, can you please tell me based on the misconceptions, how much nuclear waste we produced thus far? So far out of all the nuclear reactors we've ever had in the United States, going back to the 1960s, right 50s 60s 70s when we built all these reactors all the nuclear waste we have ever produced would fit on a single football field at a height of 10 yards yeah that, like, that's it <laughs> and that is such a small amount because it's it's been decades literally decades and 
out of all the electricity we've produced, it's the amount of waste is minuscule compared to that of our fossil fuels. Yeah, and honestly, that's a great way to segue. And we should have segued in the first segment, but we're doing it now. So <laughs> <laughs> if you think about the waste, right? I, myself, if I use nuclear energy to do whatever I needed from through my whole lifetime, it would be in the size of a freaking Coke can. Mm -hmm. And now I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that it's in the hundreds of rail cars filled with coal if you use, your, use coal over your entire life. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, there is a huge difference in energy density. So... Can I just chime in here? Yeah. Um, going back to the waste very briefly, the nuclear industry is the only energy industry in the entire nation that is legally required to plan for storage of their waste and actually take into account and predict how much waste they're going to produce and figure out plans to safely store and control waste. The nuclear waste industry in and of itself is one of the most refined, well-tracked waste management industries in the nation. It's, it's ridiculous the amount of uh, control and regulations and uh, policy that goes into something like nuclear, use nuclear fuel when we're producing things like tons and tons of coal ash like literally tons of coal ash. And what do we do with it? You know, like, that's, put it somewhere. that exactly. And uh, all the pollution and everything else, it's just absolutely insane. And the nuclear industry is the only industry that actually has a plan for what to do with their waste. Yeah. So I, I want to say, I want to do this by the numbers and then say just a little blurb about climate change. So whenever I was talking about energy density earlier, if I had one kilogram of coal, you're going to get about 25 megajoules. I know megajoules doesn't mean anything to the common person. So if you compare that equally to one kilogram of say uranium 235, so a few pellets in the, the, in the uh, fuel rod, that gives you 25 terajoules. So that's a million times more efficient in terms of supplying energy. Now, whenever I was talking about the the waste, right? What what creates? I mean, you can go to our climate change episode. I had a, a climate scientist, a PhD, talking to me about climate science for literally two freaking hours. So if you want to learn about climate science, go watch that. Just watch, listen to that episode. But the fact of the matter is, is that global warming is a consequence of expelling greenhouse gases, mainly CO2. Now, global warming then has all these adverse effects that creates climate change. So when I think of global warming, I think of something that's innately, innately caused by CO2 emissions. And that creates all these other blah, blah, blah things that are really horrible from you know, a social standpoint, an economic standpoint, an environmental standpoint. I want to give you this really interesting fact that I think that you can really take home and I'm, I'm going to read it that way it's verbatim. Okay. So since 1971, the nuclear nuclear energy has prevented 64, 64 gigatons of CO2 from being emitted into the atmosphere. That is equivalent to the U S burning coal for 35 years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, so it's and, and unfortunately you could go down this road and talking about about politics, which Kaylee's really good at talking about politics. <laughs> uh, I don't want to talk about it because that's not the point of the show. This the point of the show is about science communication. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just insane that we have this issue going on with a, a wonderful way to plug and play, right? We have a good plug and play solution. Additionally, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I think that nuclear is a wonderful way to balance a an energy sector. What what are your what are your thoughts on that? So I think uh, nuclear energy as a whole needs to be 
the baseline for electricity production, right? So we we need electricity that is getting to the point where it's essentially a basic human need um, in today's society. And so to be able to produce that electricity in a clean manner, um, so in a manner that's not damaging our environment, producing tons and tons of CO2, um, and not to mention like the really crappy effects of things like coal um, polluting the air and then impacting people's lungs um, and the health impacts of that that nobody talks about. But I digress. We need a clean, reliable, non-weather dependent energy source to be able to constantly produce electricity. And I think that's the role that nuclear needs to play. I think we need to be producing a base load of power from nuclear and then to perform what we call load following to increase the amount of electricity produced on really hot days when more people want to use air conditioning, you know, to follow the demand for electricity and sort of increase or decrease, you know, at nighttime, most people are sleeping. So they're not using a lot of, you know, their lights, their maybe it's cooler out, they don't have air conditioning on or things like that, you know, that's where I think the role of wind and solar come into play. Um, mm -hmm. I think wind and solar could be very useful to meet load following demands. Um, but for that base load power, I am convinced it needs to be nuclear. Um, I think that's our only option. I like that. I mean, I never even... This is why you know you you communicate pe with people that that know more than you do about a, you know about a subject, uh, because I was always thinking as nuclear as being like an insurgence factor rather than a baseline. But that it kind of makes sense to have a baseline, and then with data you can match needs, say nighttime needs versus daytime needs versus time of the year needs. Say whenever it's it's hot or it's too cold mm -hmm. or et cetera. You have you know crazy weather events that go on that that block out you know renewable capabilities so i was thinking as a as an insurgence factor but it really needs to be a baseline factor for example think about the effects of the texas freeze right if the texas if texas had in its energy grid since it's a, a sole propri proprietary in terms of energy uh if it had a baseline of, of nuclear that wouldn't have happened then what would have only failed in that manner is its renewables. And it wouldn't have had to rely on something that, you know, was subject to a, a flawed incident like what happened with their natural gas. And that's what caused the, in, in, in essence, very simplistically, the Texas freeze. So if you had a really good baseline like nuclear, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have happened. Well, and statistically, it just makes more sense to have the most reliable source as the base load, right? Like mm -hmm. where we're getting our core energy support should come from the one energy source we have out there that you put the fuel in the reactor and press go and that's it. I mean, maintaining a nuclear reactor is pretty minimal. I mean, you typically have your reactor operator, maybe um, a couple other guys on site, guys or girls on site, um, to act as backup in case anything happens to the reactor operator. Um, and then you have some people for maintenance, but that's, that's pretty much it. Different energy sources need that kind of constant maintenance. I mean, solar mm -hmm. panel, what if it snows? You have to clean them off, right? Or if they get covered in dust or sand, you have to clean them off. You know, wind turbines, it's, very easy for the blades on wind turbines to break or become damaged and things like that. You know, nuclear power plants for the most part on the maintenance side of things, maintenance is very minuscule. It happens infrequently. You know, you'll have your refueling outages where you stop for maybe a couple weeks um, to rearrange the fuel in your reactor core to make sure you're producing the perfect amount of electricity but other than that you know and if 
you stagger those refueling outages correctly, then you're never going to be in a situation where you don't have power, you know, and that's where we're getting to, especially as we're approaching winter and getting to the point where we need heat. Pipes are freezing. People are freezing, you know, and we need to keep human beings warm and alive. And to do that, we need power. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, I think also to build off of this segment, we did touch upon the social and I guess the the emotional aspect of this. And, and um, one thing that I think is most important whenever I talk to anybody about energy or about climate change or even just as simplistic as global warming, we have to think about the emotional standpoint, right? Because that's how everybody else relates. You know, not everybody's going to know about PPMs or what that does in terms of warming to the oceans and, you know, water vapor in the atmospheres and positive feedback loops. But what they do understand is, is emotion and uh, social implications. One thing is, and, and I will also read verbatim off of what I have here, is safety. Like safety is super important. Science cl uh, coins coal, oil, natural gas as being silent killers. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you the statistics, then you'll be like, oh, well, now I can kind of understand. But let me give like an example of nuclear to coal versus an airplane versus a car. And it's very, very similar. If you think about it, when an airplane crashes, do you see it in the news? Absolutely. Every, t every single time. But the thing is, car deaths happen every day by the thousands. And the statistics show that. Airplanes are extremely safe. And I honestly would rather get in an airplane than, than get in a car. Uh, every day, you, when you step into a car, you take a risk on your life. Uh, that's a lot greater than stepping into an airplane. Same thing with you're thinking about using coal by the majority versus nuclear energy. And, I, and I'm going to extend that to all fossil fuels. See, by literally by the thousands, even almost towards the millions, of people die every year due to related incidents of carcin carcinogens, mining accidents, et cetera, that are related to coal, oil, and natural gas. And I get it. You're probably thinking, but wait, there's a shitload of fossil fuel industry, but there's not as much with nuclear. Let me tell you some statistics. So you can break this down per kilowatt hour and it makes way more sense, right? You're you're taking that, you know, that overarching, well, I have this piece of the pie and this is a little sliver. But if you break it down per kilowatt hour, that output, you get in terms of coal, over 100,000 deaths per terawatt hour. If you compare that to wind, 150. If you compare that to nuclear, it's 90. Even with all of the events that we're going to talk about in segment three, it's still the safest energy that we have on the market. Well, one more thing, one more thing. So if we went so from if we went from coal to nuclear in 1965, the height of the excitement of, of nuclear energy, I'm just going to coin it at that. It's, it's not obviously 1965, but it's in that time frame. Air pollution deaths that could have been prevented totals to 81 million lives. Wow. That's almost a third of the amount of people that are living in the United States at this moment. So that's an insane number. That's a huge number. And if we want to talk about outside of the United States, we can talk about the leading coal producer in the world, which is China. And 4,000 people in China die every day from effects of fossil fuels. So I don't think I need to really... I hate, I, I'm, I feel like I'm fear mongering, but I'm just trying to show statistics in an mm -hmm. emotional and social standpoint that mm -hmm. it is important that we, of course, not, not switch from fossil fuels right now, but phase them out effectively and quickly. Mm -hmm. okay. That's my rant. <laughs> no, I, I think it's great. And I, uh, um, I thank you for bringing up the actual st statistics because it's, so important to realize and bring to people's attention that the reality is coal is killing people like that 
that's happening. Fossil fuels are killing our planet and killing people on our planet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the missing piece that most people don't understand and don't see is Yes, we see CO2 levels and rising temperatures and climate change is a serious issue. But on a more personal level, pollution is killing people, right? Pollution is harming people. It creates lung diseases. It causes so many issues that, you know, we take for granted, especially living in the United States where you can walk outside and see a blue sky. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in other parts of the world, that is not the case. And sure. so recognizing that just kind of drives home the point even further that we are in desperate, desperate need of a clean energy source yeah. where I think nuclear fits the bill. Um, I, I also wanted to throw in there, we were talking about kilowatt hours, just so we understand like what that means. An electric dishwasher runs on two kilowatt hours per load. Mm -hmm. So that's like base idea of what that is, or like an oven runs on just over two kilowatt hours per hour. Um, household things run on like one to two kilowatt hours. Um just to give some context and maybe help digest that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. If you want to see something visual and if you don't believe me, which that's fine. <laughs> I don't care if you believe me, it's true. Whether yeah, you believe it or not, please, please fact check us. Yeah. Just Google, uh, air pollution in China. And then you'll be like, wow, no wonder why 4,000 people were affected every single day. And then you'll be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So you'll get visual statistics you're hearing it, you're seeing it. There you go. Uh, so one thing that I do want to kind of end on, because mm -hmm. I think this is really important, and we talked about this offset, is the, the phasing out, right? And the issues with nuclear. I don't know if you want to get into that before I say anything, because I think I think you can really yeah. sum it up. Yeah, no. Um, so unfortunately, we receive a lot of negative negativity um towards nuclear energy and a lot of that is based off of the more emotional ties of past accidents you know and we'll kind of get into that in the next segment and touch on that a little bit but the the thing is nuclear reactors are starting to be phased out or at least they were just recently between January and March, April this past year, um, we saw a lot of nuclear reactors um, starting to shut down for things as little as political concerns, right? People rallying and trying to push anti-nuclear narratives that are for the most part based on very real and very understandable human emotions. Um, but it's, and so I can't completely shut down a lot of these anti-nuclear movements because people have emotions, they have feelings, and people are traumatized by the accidents, right? Especially, yeah. especially Chernobyl, which was hands down the worst of the three. Um, and on top of that, you know, seeing propaganda and seeing the ramifications of weapons I hate to bring it up, but it's a real thing that causes fear. Um, and mm -hmm. that fear and lack of understanding and lack of resources to educate yourself as a member of the general public feeds into this sort of hatred toward this technology. And uh, so that hatred and dislike and negativity um, generates this stigma behind nuclear and eventually politicians will listen to what their people want and they will shut yeah. down nuclear power plants. And when that happens, we see things like what happened in Germany this past year. Yeah. Um, we saw so many nuclear power plants shut down because of this kind of anti-nuclear stigma. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we saw Germany turning to coal as 
a resource for electricity, given everything that happened with Russia and international relations. Yeah. Their last resort was to turn to coal and turning to coal, as we just talked about, has so many more awful ramifications than nuclear, you know, and it gets to a point where, you know, nuclear can kind of be tied to just energy security and homeland security in general. You know, you want to be able to produce your own electricity on your own turf so that when these messy international conflicts occur, your people can still have power, you know, in this crazy technological society that we live in. We we also need to meet basic human needs. And part of that is electricity. And so it's just it's unfortunate to see what has happened. Um, but I I think last I heard Germany was turning towards they kept their last nuclear plant open. Mm -hmm. And I believe they are looking into reopening some of the plants that they shut down um, because of this conflict and because of the issue with coal. Don't quote me on that. But there's definitely been a lot of thought. And I think a lot of the world has learned from this. And that is kind of reinvigorating the sort of nuclear renaissance that we had happen in the early 2000s. I think mm -hmm. we're pushing towards that now because we've seen just how essential nuclear power is to our homeland security, our energy security, and uh, overall the well-being of people in human beings. Right, right. And whenever I was talking about, and that's a great example, so I want to put it in context. So obviously our biggest fight for climate change is, you know, getting rid of non-renewable resources or fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you have to make up a margin that fossil fuels is producing for that output, right? You want to sustain, if not provide more energy for increasing needs. So whenever you see the trend line of nuclear energy, you know, negative, you have to think back to whenever I was talking about energy density. Per kilogram, you get a million times more energy. That is huge. So if you take away nuclear, now you have to make up that margin plus what is needed by society in an increasing rate. And the only thing that you have left is renewables. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, you have to keep there's just such a massive deficit that you have to implement or, or I guess fight by the implementation of renewables. And that is really difficult, like mm -hmm. extremely difficult because renewables only work in certain areas and based on data can get you optimization in only certain areas. You can only do so much with it. So I think that's something that's what Germany is realizing is they're taking away their nuclear and they're like, holy shit, we got to we got to put in X amount of coal plants to keep up with our needs because it's not as energy dense. And that's not good, right? It's you're just adding to the problem that's already surfacing. Technically, if you can if you increase the effects of climate change, you're going to need more energy anyways. <laughs> so you're digging yourself a hole and the pit keeps falling in on you. It's it's just it's not good. It, and, and I hope that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it really, uh, I think you did a great job explaining that, Sam. And uh, it, it really does. That's the thing that people don't realize is nuclear power plants don't take up a lot of space and it doesn't take a lot to produce a lot, right? We put a little bit in and we get a ton out, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, really to i guess again drive home this point that you're making like when you take away that resource then it takes that much more coal that much more renewables that we don't have yeah. right that's yeah. why europe's in a kind of a crisis right now in terms of making sure that they have energy for people for this mm -hmm. winter mm -hmm. it's legit additionally i just want to add this just because i don't know if people heard this in the news but i don't know if it was like a month maybe two two months ago there was a meeting with opec 
And if you're not familiar with OPEC, that's what produces like literally almost 80% of the world's oil at the moment. And they brought in other countries from say like South America. So let's just say 10 extra countries in one room accounted for 90 some percent of oil produced in the world. And what they did was they said, we're just going to cut production uh, because we can. And I, I don't care what your affiliation is politically, but the president of the U.S. said, that's a humanitarian crisis because we and other other countries in this world need your oil to survive. And there's such a dependence on fossil fuels right now that if you do that, you are literally killing people even without emissions and carcinogens, et cetera, or mining accidents. You're killing people. And that's an attack on humanity. And that's that's literally effed. I can't say anything <laughs> else, but that's effed. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not a fan of that. And it's it, it's to the point where I think people need to realize that fossil fuels, I, I get it, it gives you a job, but at the end of the day, you can switch your job and also save lives. Like we can save lives and make the world better by waning out fossil fuels over time. No fear mongering, just relaying the facts and the correlations. Mm -hmm. That is why we need things like nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. And I get it. I, I want to address one more thing, I think. And yes, I think you yes. can um, add to this. Something that we didn't talk about in segment one is the misconceptions of why it takes so long to build nuclear power plants. Yes. It's, it's extremely important because the average time that it takes to build one is like six years. Whereas mm -hmm. you can build, say, two or three solar farms in that time frame. Right. It's mm -hmm. like about two years for a solar farm, give or mm -hmm. take. And the reason why it takes so long is based on regulation and mm -hmm. cost. Mm -hmm. And you know as well as I do, it's nobody wants to invest on something that takes eight to ten years to have a payback period. Payback period is how much money you invest and then mm -hmm. when I start to see profit. The cool thing about nuclear, and and I'll let you add on whatever after this. The cool thing about nuclear is that say if I stack it up between or against a natural gas plant versus a, a nuclear plant, okay, it takes six years and it takes say a billion dollars and this nuclear, this um, natural gas takes two years and it's already up and running. If you look at a 10 year period, nuclear plants way surpassing any money that you're going to make in profit versus a, a natural gas plant. I run the numbers, go look it up. I'm, I'm dead serious. The problem is nobody wants to play the long game. Mm -hmm. No. And that I don't get me started. That ties into instant gratification and things we're looking at and looking for as human beings right now. Nobody wants to wait. Everybody wants everything yesterday. Right. But focusing on why it takes so long to build a nuclear power plant. So one of the biggest factors um, is that these nuclear power plants in the past have been very, very large, right? And each of these plants are individually custom built and custom making each part one by one for, for instance, the reactor pressure vessel, this sits at the bottom of the reactor and holds the fuel right? This pressure vessel is massive and can only be custom made in, I think, China and maybe Russia. Mm -hmm. I know China is one of the places, but international competitors that <laughs> we are turning to, to manufacture these, these parts for our nuclear reactors. And that's definitely, definitely an issue. It causes slowdowns. Um, and uh, it essentially results in increased costs and an increased timeline. So one of, and I'll touch on it more when we get into segment three, looking at the future of nuclear. But one of the things that the company New Scale has been working adamantly on is creating these small modular reactors. It's kind of a buzzword. You hear it in the news, mm. but these small modular reactors or SMRs are, I think of them as like Legos, right? So they're these reactors that we can like link on top of each other, like you link Legos 
not physically on top of each other, but next to each other, right? And if we have four small nuclear reactors next to each other that equate to the power output of one of these larger reactors, these smaller reactors have smaller parts that can be produced here in the United States, or I mean, outsourced to other countries, but then we can start creating these nuclear power plants all in one uniform cookie cutter manner and we can start to mass produce these parts and ultimately that will drive down costs that will speed up production drastically because we're not custom welding each individual piece and it ultimately will come to the point where we can have nuclear power fast available, efficient. Um, and so new scale is definitely one that I'm looking to and hoping for um, them to come to fruition in commercializing the small modular reactor design. Um, that being said, another thing to keep in mind is that these nuclear power plants, we haven't built one since the 1970s. In the last 30 years, Maybe it's like 40 years now, 50 years. But the statistic I know is in the last 30 years, we have not built a single nuclear power plant, new nuclear power plant in the United States. Commercially, the U.S. nuclear Navy has produced well over 50 in the last <laughs> 10 years. Um, but I digress. That's a fun little comparison to show that it is possible and yeah. we can do it. Um, but the U.S. industry, we haven't constructed a reactor. We've had Vogel under construction for the past, I don't know, eight years, six years. Um, and the reason it's taking so long is because one, it's one of these massive oversized reactors, but then two, it's the first of its kind. Mm. Right. It is the first of its kind. This is the first time we're building a an AP 1000 reactor in the United States and building a first of a kind reactor. You're going to run into holdups. You're going to run into issues. You're going to run into unexpected, unanticipated problems and running into those unanticipated problems is going to slow things down and jack up costs. Mm -hmm. We are learning from this process. Um, we're actually already planning fuel loading. I think, I think Vogel started loading fuel in the last couple weeks. And so we should see that reactor go online in early 2023, finally. But the point is, we've learned from those mistakes. Westinghouse has learned from those mistakes. Um, and uh, Georgia Power is learning from those mistakes. And we can apply the lessons we've learned so that the next time this doesn't take as long. The learning curve. Wait, where was this again? Curve. This is um plant Vogel in Georgia. Oh my goodness. I think I know somebody that worked on that plant. Really? Yeah. From a structural engineering standpoint. Yeah. In Waynesboro, Georgia. Yep. Yep. I'm at the sentiment I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, just to end on a, a, a really light note. So I think you need to talk to your people at MIT and start <laughs> to figure out how you can 3D print the, the parts for these small uh, modular reactors. You have it even faster. On it. People are <laughs> sure. already working on it. Uh, Idaho National Lab and Argonne National Lab and yeah. Oak Ridge National Lab. We have the ideas and we're excited. Yeah. I'm excited. I can't wait to I can't wait to report them. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So I think we can wrap up here. And since this is a, a light note, I apologize for all of the emotional arguments that we're making, but I think it's the best way to get the point across. Uh, but when we come back for segment three, we're going to be talking a little bit about the timeline of nuclear energy. So again, stick around. Segment three, this is the final segment. Yes, it's been a wonderful journey that we've taken so far. And we're talking about the timeline of nuclear energy. And we're gonna start obviously chronological. We're gonna start kind of where it all began or in terms of things that have happened in the past that we would like to address. Not, not myself really, but 
that Kaylee would like to address. So Kaylee, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and you got the reins. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously, um, or maybe not obviously, but most often the main questions I get as a nuclear engineer are what about the accidents? Nuclear yeah. is dangerous. So many people were hurt. So many people, so, so much damage. And uh, in general, people are very, very concerned about the safety because of the experiences we've had and seen with these accidents. And I think one of the most chilling experiences and uh, one of the main reasons why people have such an emotional connection to these accidents, even though most people were not a di directly impacted from a health standpoint, um, one of the main reasons we see so much emotional um, distress around these accidents is because people have to evacuate their homes, right? People have to leave everything that they've ever known, everything they've ever loved, their, their homes where their lives revolve. And it's traumatizing. It's not fun. As someone who spent almost 10 years in Florida, um, having to evacuate for a hurricane, it's scary. You have to leave your home and you don't know if you can come back to it. You know, and I think that is one of the main reasons people have been so emotionally distressed behind these accidents. Um, but anyway, let's kind of focus in and zone in on the three main accidents, um, starting with the first one, the one we all know and love, Chernobyl. Um, so this uh, this incident spawned an excellent HBO miniseries. Um, I was a fan. Um, and I have to say, if you haven't seen the miniseries, um, I would go watch it. I think it did a great job of explaining what happened and why. Um, and maybe focusing less on fear mongering and more on emotional tactics and more on what actually happened and explaining that in a digestible manner. So great mini series, but if you don't feel like watching it, the kind of overarching cause for this accident starts with the USSR, right? So this reactor, nuclear power plant, um, is operating under the Soviet Union's rule regime. Um, and uh, the Soviet Union was not the most, how should I say, flexible, giving, um, mm -hmm. in a sense where they really just didn't want to communicate all the information that they should have. Um, and that was the driving force behind Chernobyl, um, in my opinion, is engineers who were operating this nuclear reactor um, they were running a bunch of tests, trying to get this reactor online, and um, they were not fully informed on the reactor type, how it works, and uh, on a very high level, being misinformed is what drove the accident to happen. Um, so I don't want to get into the nitty gritty technical details, but this one I very much believe is because our engineers were misinformed. Um, now, Three Mile Island rocked a lot of people's worlds. Um, and Sam, you're the you're the you're the local. So if uh, you want to chime in on that. Yeah, local as in being 300 miles away. But well, um, I know people that grew up in Harrisburg that were literally 10 miles from the site. And mm -hmm. the miscommunication. And I think mm -hmm. that's where not only the miscommunication, but a lot of it had to do with maintenance as well. Two key factors in that is that in the reactor area, uh, there's shut off valves um, and there's valves that like are emergency valves to implement water whenever you have a lack of water in the reactor, which we know is a really big issue when you don't have the moderator, right? Something to slow down the fission. Mm -hmm. Now, 
there was stalactites and stalagmites that were growing in the reactor area off of the valves. That's one. Number two, in the control area where all the, the shutoffs, the buttons, et cetera, that go on to maintain that, that facility, there were at least 50 to about 50 to 100 different buttons that were flashing. And flashing is not good. Let me just, I'm just putting it in really simple terms. Flashing's not good. So whenever they were going through these, the issues, right, that were leading up to the problems that happened at Three Mile, in that control room, there was literally a doubling amount of flashing buttons. How was a control room expert supposed to know what button to even push to, to fix a freaking issue? Secondly, there was a big PR problem. A huge PR. I, I wouldn't even say big. It's monumental. And that's the reason why there's so much misinformation that came out of that incident. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's labeled as an incident, not a, you know, a catastrophe. Hell, even President Jimmy Carter went on to the site. He was even a nuclear expert and said, this is a minor incident. <laughs> and a, like literally on the site there, it's it's verbatim. Mm -hmm. So. The only radiation, and, and, and I'll just jump to the point that there was PR issues, there was maintenance issues, there's communication issues um, within the people who run the facility and then with the, the public. What, what kills me is that there was so many misinformed reports about radiation exposure through the water table and through air that created all of this cancer. And that is absolutely false. Any peer-reviewed thing that you will read, any peer-reviewed journal, paper, et cetera, that has came out of Three Mile Island will tell you the exact same thing, and that is not a single death has been attributed to that incident. It was all horribly, horribly relayed to the public. And if you want to say bullshit, go look it up. I, I, I encourage you to look at something that is peer-reviewed because – the only thing that was ever released was actually by a supervisor that did it on his own terms and didn't freaking tell anybody. And what he released were inert gases such as krypton and xenon that mm -hmm. decay extremely readily. Additionally, any of the water that came from that, from that reactor was processed on site. There wasn't things that were leaked into the water table downstream. So I encourage you to look things up in a responsible and sourced manner and, and find that information for yourself. But I, what I'm telling you is it's not a tragedy of, of, of health. It is a tragedy of misinformation. And it is minuscule if that. Actually, it's amazing the way that it didn't create harm. It didn't create an explosion. It was all on site. It was extremely impressive how they that it was maintained and kept in house. Mm -hmm. and extremely impressive. That that's just like a great segue into the biggest point I think I want to make about Three Mile Island. It is the perfect demonstration of why the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission is the best nuclear regulatory body in the world. Like the USNRC stands at number one because we are capable of mitigating these accidents, right? And uh, all Three Mile Island does is really demonstrates that we can mitigate accidents, plain and simple. Um, I definitely think I misspoke earlier, um, but just to give everyone an actual timeline of when these things happened, so Three Mile Island was in, uh, what 79, is it? Right? 79, yeah. Chernobyl was in 1986. And then Fukushima, which we'll get to next, was in 2011, right? So we had Three Mile Island first, which was like this kind of baby hiccup accident. And uh, then we had this massive, awful accident at Chernobyl. And then we see the Fukushima accident more recently in the early 2000s. Um, I was actually alive for that one. <laughs> um, so 
I really just want to establish this timeline so we know, first off, Three Mile Island was a long time ago. Technology has changed quite a bit since then. Now, the second thing I want to bring up is that the Chernobyl accident, the by far worst accident of all three, one of the main reasons it was as disastrous as it was is it didn't have what we call containment. In the United States, we require all our nuclear reactors to have several layers of containment. And these containment structures are structures that are physically built around the nuclear reactor to contain any radioactivity or radiation in the case of an accident. And that is like our overarching, it's like the first layer of defense, right? Um, or the last layer of defense or however you want to look at it. But that is what prevents the awful impacts to destroying the environment that a nuclear meltdown without containment can have, right? Um, And the other thing to bring up too is if you go to the Chernobyl site today, which you can physically go there today, it is safe. The wildlife in the area is flourishing. So I will just throw that out there. Um, We don't have like squirrels with two heads running around. We don't have deer with like five eyes running around um we we see green grass and trees growing and healthy animals um living and thriving so just to say yes it's been um about 30 years since the chernobyl accident and uh, with that we're we're still seeing after a couple decades, the area come back to life, right? So um, not to minimize the impacts and the scariness of it all, because it was a scary accident. Um, And there were about 60 people that died Mm -hmm. from that accident. Not to minimize it, but the reactor site didn't have containment. And that is like the biggest safety measure that we follow in the United States. Obviously, we can't control what what other countries do um, and how they regulate their nuclear energy. But in the US, Chernobyl physically cannot happen. Just throwing that out there. Now, when we get into Fukushima, which again, that was much more recently, 2011, so, Last year, we had our 10-year anniversary, um, and uh, this accident, just so everybody kind of understands what happened, we first, Japan was hit with an earthquake, and the reactor shut down safely. The reactor was cool. Um, It was safe. It was not operating during the earthquake, and it withstood the earthquake. The reactor was safe, good, um, and uh, it wasn't until a tsunami hit Japan and that tsunami flooded the basement of the reactor site. The reactor itself was still safe and secure, but there was no electricity because power outages as a result of the earthquake and tsunami. And... uh, To keep these reactors cool, we have to keep water flowing through them, right? And nuclear power plants in the past have had backup diesel power generators to power pumps to keep the reactor cool if power is lost. Unfortunately, these pumps were stored in the basement of the facility that flooded. So as a result, we had no power source to keep these pumps online and keep the reactor cool and safe and secure. And that's why we saw the accident that we did. Um, And that's a very human mistake, you know? That's not something you can really blame on the technology. You know, natural disasters happen and the reactor was safe from the natural disaster. The silliest little thing is flooding the generators to power the pumps. Um, But that kind of leads me into the next thing I want to talk about here is 
implementing all the things we've learned from those accidents in our present and our future nuclear reactors. So our present nuclear reactors since the Fukushima accident have, first off, all of them have had containment since before Chernobyl. That's been a thing. That's why Three Mile Island wasn't a bad accident. That's why Three Mile Island was contained and safe and nobody got hurt. So with today's nuclear reactors, after Fukushima, all of our nuclear reactors were retrofitted with what we call passive safety systems. So these passive safety systems essentially prevent what happened at Fukushima from ever happening in the United States. So like I said, we need pumps to pump water through the reactor to keep that reactor cool. Um, uh, those pumps need electricity and need to be powered. But what if we could use natural convection currents to keep the water flowing on its own? Then we wouldn't need pumps. You know, convection currents taking you back to like sixth grade science, boiling water on the stove. You know, the hot water moves to the top, the cold water flows to the bottom. And it's those kind of, that kind of flow that we've engineered and retrofitted our reactors with so that we don't need pumps to keep water running through the reactor and keep the reactor cool. Systems like this that scientifically prevent these accidents from ever occurring again are what we have introduced in our reactors that are operating today and these new designs for the future. So in segment two, I spoke a little bit about the AP-1000 reactor, the Westinghouse AP-1000 that has been under construction for quite some time in Georgia, Plant Vogel. So this reactor is a, what we call a generation three plus reactor, okay? So to take a step back, all the nuclear reactors we have, we kind of refer to in these different generations, right? Um, so it's kind of like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, you know, like um, like invention names, like in incrementing mm -hmm. our yeah. designs, right? Um, so our generation one reactors from like the 1950s, those are your very um, basic prototypic nuclear reactors. And then moving into the 1970s, we start to see the commercialization of nuclear power. And these are what we call generation two reactors. So we're looking at all the standard nuclear reactors we have operating today. Um, and then generation three is where we start to get more advanced light water reactors. Um, and uh, get into this advanced design. And that's where we see the CANDU reactor up in Canada, excuse me, the Canadian design. And moving forward into this Gen 3 Plus, which is where we are now, what we're constructing, that is the AP1000 reactor that's under construction right now. That's moving into the phase of advanced reactors and evolutionary reactors. So this is a whole field in the nuclear industry dedicated to this innovation, right? And something I think a lot of people don't realize is that even though we have this older technology and these older nuclear power plants in operation, we're constantly retrofitting them with improvements, right? Like uh, if you bought a house from the 1800s. It's been renovated a few times since the 1800s, right? Um, it's the same kind of concept there where these reactors are being renovated regularly. Um, and that's something I really would like to drive home. Now, going into the Gen 4 designs, we start to see this is what we're shooting for by the 2030s. And this is the future of nuclear. And that's where I I mentioned new scale a little bit before in these small modular reactors um, and how they could really, really change the industry. But another company I want to bring up is Oaklo. Oaklo is working on designing what we call a micro reactor, even smaller than a small modular reactor. 
And one of the things that Oklo is really trying to introduce and commercialize in the United States is recycling nuclear fuel. So a lot of people don't realize we can actually recycle our waste. We can recycle that used fuel. According to the Department of Energy, 90% of potential energy remains in nuclear fuel after that fuel has completed its lifetime in the nuclear reactor. So we can still harness 90% of the total fuel energy. One of my professors at Florida used to say it's like taking a bite out of a Snickers bar and throwing the rest away. Um, so if we take this fuel and put it into what we call a breeder reactor, um, we can separate the uranium that is still in the fuel from some plutonium that might be in the fuel, right? And then we can take the uranium and the plutonium and make new fuel, right? And so this goes into this kind of fuel recycling process that we call reprocessing in the industry. Um, but Oklo is making strides to actually commercialize that process here in the US. Um, it has been very successful in France. Um, and uh, one of the reasons we haven't done it in the past in the United States is because it's been less expensive to just mine for the fuel, right? But now we're getting to a point where we want to be able to actually recycle that fuel because we have all this spent fuel building up, right? Yeah. And instead of having it just sit there and decay away, mm -hmm. why not use the energy that's there? Um, so that's uh, one of the things I wanted to bring attention to. Oaklow is commercializing that process, um, which is so exciting to hear. And I really hope to see within the next 10 to 20 years. That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, and I, I do want to make this really quick point mm -hmm. that the public perception, unfortunately, is focused on the things that happened in the past, which have slowed the progression of the commercial portion of nuclear energy. But one thing that I think is really hard to for, for the public to understand because they don't see it is the advancements in the science, the advancements from research. And that's where you're getting these really exciting, like these really exciting applications in terms of reprocessing or changing the, the ability to not have to use pumps or even like what I was telling you offset with that, uh, that professor from Cal Berkeley, that's using a whole different approach. Uh, instead of the, the fuel rods, he's using the spheroids of uranium 235 that are encased in, in a ceramic such that whenever you have say non flux of water in your reactor, say there's no water that comes in your, all, all those spheroids just fall out of the reactor and go into a containment bin that don't melt down. They, they just dissipate that heat, cool off. What I'm trying to say is, is that the research never stopped and there's awesome like possibilities that are right there. Mm -hmm. All we need is public perception. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's, that's the thing just to kind of reiterate that is we have made so many advancements. They're just not hugely advertised, right? And so the public doesn't get to see all the work that people like people like me do behind the scenes working on research to advance these reactor designs, you know, increasing uh, security, right? Increasing uh, security and uh, preventing proliferation threats and uh, increasing safety, reducing the risk of accidents. Um, there's so many people that work on this in this industry and work tirelessly and relentlessly. And we've come up with some really exciting things. It's just, we're getting to a point where we need to start focusing on social sciences and communicating the things that we've created yeah. and innovated to the public and that is overarching theme what we need to be doing as an industry if we want to move forward i agree that was i think that's a really good place to stop so 
Kaylee, I just want to say thank you so much for joining the podcast. This has been awesome. We haven't really talked about energy much, so this was a really good way to to start out a good series of talking about energy, talking about climate change, talking about the implementation and the history of nuclear energy, how it works. It, it was overall a very informative podcast, so thank you very much. Awesome. Sam, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for reaching out to me. This has been awesome. And, you know, if anyone ever has any questions, reach out to me on TikTok or Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, links are in the description. So I got you. <laughs> <laughs> well, take care, Kaylee. Awesome. Thank you so much. That is all for this episode of Everything Steam. I just wanted to take a quick second and thank Kaylee for taking the time to share her knowledge on nuclear energy. I highly recommend you give Kaylee a follow on TikTok just like I did. Her handle is at Miss Nuclear Energy and she has a plethora of videos addressing a bunch of the topics that we covered today and much more. I would also love to mention my amazing team for their collective efforts to make the show happen. This podcast was edited by Ariel Piermont, marketed by Courtney Page, QC'd by Panya Pit Erickson, and our episode art was created by Gabrielle Edmiston. After the episode, please give our podcast a rating and review on whatever platform you get your podcasts on. We're always looking for feedback, and the rating would greatly help us out in the fight against the algorithms. Lastly, be sure to check us out on all the socials for podcast news, upcoming episodes, and fun Steam content. Just search Everything Steam on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Reddit to join in on the fun. Once again, thank you very much for listening to Everything Steam. I am your host, Sam Stanford, and as always, stay curious.